Hello everyone and welcome to the Corridale Reviews. So, uh, normally we do the Emmerdale Review first, but I've not seen all the Emmerdales, I've seen all the Coronation Streets, so I'm going to do the Coronation Street Review first, so all the Corrie fans rejoice. So, uh, yeah, very busy week. Uh, as I said last week, I forgot to bring up the Josh storyline, as I made a note of it on the description of the video. Um, I did say I'm pretty sure he will uh, return this week, uh, which he did. It did look for a second like he wouldn't return, but we did see, uh, we did see Josh, uh, but he didn't see any of us uh, because he's blind. <laughs> so, okay, so we had a few storylines, so I've decided to be a bit more organised this week so I don't forget key storylines like I did last week. I've made little notes all colour-coded and everything. Uh, so let's just jump right into it. So I think the main storyline of the week, the main storyline was the whole factory. So um, Alia decided to sell the factory back to Carla. Uh, about time. And it's one of those cases where you have a character making an argument with another character and just completely ignoring the arguments against them, like the arguments that Carla was making that she sold all her shares to Aiden and she wouldn't didn't want Ali to have her shares and then the other characters just like oh no but it was in his will and everything it's almost like they don't understand it and then all of a sudden you have it where they have to explain their actions to someone else and they they almost do understand um the argument the other person's making and it was similar to a scene in Emmerdale where um Debbie uh inadvertently got Ross uh, attacked with acid and uh, Ross is very unforgiving of Debbie until he has to explain to Sarah, oh, but hang on, it wasn't completely Debbie's fault. But obviously when Debbie's trying to explain herself to Ross, he's all like, oh, but but you organised acid to be thrown in my face. But um, when he's explaining it to Sarah, he's like, well, your mum didn't mean to get acid in my face. So it's a bit like that. Um, but finally, Alia has realised that maybe she should not have Underworld. Maybe Underworld should stay with the Connors. Um, but Alia wants to invest the money into Zidane's business uh, because Imran wants to take his investment out. Alia decides that she wants the 18% that Aidan would have given her um, if Carla hadn't given Aidan all of her shares. Uh, but then says she needs double because she wants to invest in the business. Um, so we see Carla trying to string along Alia. And, you know, it's a bit sort of whose side are you on? Sort of thing, because Carla can't really afford to pay double. She can afford single. It's a bit unfair on Maria. And it's going to be interesting to see how or if even Maria is going to be able to get her salon up and running. I'm still thinking it's a scam. It's probably not a scam, but uh, that's the thing about soaps is you can't trust characters you don't regularly see, can you? So Maria doesn't have Carla's backing anymore, so Maria's going to have to find another way to get her salon up and running. But I think there is somebody else who could help Maria with the factory, but I'm going to get to that later. Peter overhears Carla struggling, so Peter decides that he is going to help Carla buy back the factory by being a sleeping partner and uh, I don't think Peter understands what a sleeping partner is because he decides to leave streetcars which ah uh, I just why Peter you're a sleeping partner uh, at the end of the week he gives Carla this whole ultimatum where he says he wants to be involved in the factory and I'm thinking well Carla's got every right to say no the deal was that you would just be a sleeping partner um, but obviously Peter's got the wrong end of the stick. Um, Carla told Peter it would never happen. And then what happens? It does happen. Uh, which is a bit annoying because you sort of see them having a nice moment. And you're thinking, oh, please, writers, please don't make them. Oh, look, it's happening. Oh, what a surprise. Oh, what? Oh, I've never seen that happen before. You have this whole thing. Um, we had this whole thing on uh, Friday's episode where Carla was talking about the person that broke her heart but she loves to the moon and back and Peter overheard 
and I think Peter might have thought that she was talking about him. Uh, it was clear to me that she was talking about Aiden. I think it was clear to a lot of people she was talking about Aiden. But it sort of shows uh, that Peter is done with Toya. Uh, passing off someone's baby as your own. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's that's a deal breaker. That so he's he's completely done with Toya. So he wants to move on, and uh, he wants to get back with Carla. Will they get back together? I'm not sure. Um, that's for you guys to decide in the comments. Let us know what you think. I'm always very interested to hear what you guys think as well. I really don't like Michelle. And as I've said many a time, and I don't like the idea of her being this, oh, I told you so character. But uh, yeah, Carla and Michelle are best friends. And they have been very pally for the last month or so now. But there was a time when they had fallen out with each other. And they hated each other. For a long while, Michelle hated Carla because Michelle slept with her son, Ali. Uh, but ah, forgive and forget, eh? Won't even talk about it. In fact, Ali's crush on Carla just seems to have just disappeared as well. We don't hear about that anymore. But but I get it. It's hard to write storylines. It's hard to write for a soap. So, you know, as viewers, we've just got to pretend that never happened. It was entertaining. But uh, yeah, we just got just to move on and... Uh, just press the reset button from every now and then. I think it's nice, though, that Aiden's death still has impact. Because let's think, how many times has Alia mentioned Luke in the last half year? Um, it's almost like she's pressed the reset button as well. Um, but it's nice that Aiden still has impact and he's got a, almost a legacy on the street. And I'm hoping that he still gets mentioned from time to time. Obviously, what made uh, Carla decide that she had to team up with Peter was when she saw Johnny watching the video of Aiden in full. Now, they had a DVD of it, so how was Johnny watching it on YouTube? Unless maybe he uploaded it to the internet, is a possibility. I think you can actually watch Aiden's interview on YouTube, but I thought it was quite strange how when Johnny's got a DVD of it, he's watching the interview on YouTube, so he's either uploaded it or, or well, as they say, if you see something like that, a wizard did it. But it's nice to see that Carla has the factory back and that she's implemented a strictly innocent until proven guilty policy so Sally can continue working there. So let's talk about Sally, arrested wearing a wig and clown makeup. I mean, does it get more embarrassing than that? Uh, Duncan, as we mentioned last week, made up allegations against Sally. So now Sally's been arrested and there's a whole trial going to be put against her. There has a phone that she's allegedly sent text from, which is just utter not true at all. Um, and it turns out that the £1,000 that Tim found in the account was actually from Duncan. So this is a very clever twist because, as we ha know, that happened a few weeks ago um, and a lot of us didn't really see that coming, uh, which shows that, yeah, Coronation Street, a lot of the storylines can be a bit predictable and a bit, we've seen it all before, but they're good at doing twists and they're good at surprising us uh, because, I'll be honest, I didn't think anything of the £1,000. I thought, oh, that's just plot convenience because... Kevin needs a thousand pounds, but it's actually directly from Duncan to make Sally look guilty. Now, this is a really good example of Chekhov's gun in effect. Uh, so for those of you that don't know what Chekhov's gun is, it is a device used in literacy and media where you don't have an event happening unless it has an effect on the plot. For instance, in Emmerdale last week, you had Rebecca escaping just to be recaptured. Pointless. No, not good writing. But here, you have the £1,000 mentioned a week, a few weeks ago, and it all just comes back now. It's revealed that it's part of another plot. It's, it was useful, and it's coming back. Everything that's happened is impacting the storyline. There are instances where it's used uh, to not very good effect. For instance, we saw Jack fall over a few weeks ago, um, and then a couple episodes later, he's got sepsis. 
Um, it wasn't really necessary to show him falling over. Um, and that's the writers trying to employ the Chekhov's gun technique. I feel it's a bit unnecessary because then we see, oh, he's fallen over. Why do we see that? What's going to happen then? It's not something we really needed to see. It's something that we could have assumed happened because, as you know, kids fall over pretty much every day. Um, but it's nice that the writers are using it and that they are. It shows the writers are using the most of the 22 minutes they have per episode uh, to give us, uh, to build up the story as well as possible. Obviously, the big problem is how can the police prove that Sally used the burner phone? Because they have absolutely no evidence that Sally sent the messages. Um, and I don't like how the police aren't throwing this away. They need actual evidence that Sally has the phone or at some point owned the phone in order to actually build a case against her. Because how can they know that Duncan didn't buy a phone and just send messages from that to another phone, which is actually what he did? So I think that if I worked for the Crown Prosecution Service, I wouldn't be able to uh, bring a case to court if I didn't have proper evidence because in real life, a case like this should just be left out of court. Also, the money... I'm not sure if the money did go to Sally's direct account. I was under the impression that the money went straight to streetcars instead. But again, Sally has got herself a lawyer to represent her. And I think as well, because a lot of those messages were sent while she was the mayor, she was probably at the time in a lot of meetings where... She was the centre of attention in a lot of the meetings. So what they could do is they could find the times that the messages were allegedly sent and have witnesses saying, oh, I didn't see Sally texting anyone in that meeting. None of us saw Sally texting anyone. And she had the full extent of our attention during that meeting. So I think that in real life, Duncan wouldn't have a case. But we've got to remember, it is a soap. So we've just got to enjoy the line and hope that Sally doesn't go to jail. And if she does, it might have to be another case of free the Weatherfield one. Obviously, it was incredibly, incredibly stupid for Sally and Tim to find Duncan's address and try and go over to speak to his daughter. Absolutely stupid, stupid decision there. And that could be... Uh, what would result in a conviction if uh, they weren't lucky enough to win the case, if Duncan actually managed to pull the wool over everyone's eyes. I think the fact that they did go to his house could be uh, what would result in the conviction, the damning piece of evidence that would result in Sally or Sally and Tim going to jail if that was to happen. And I'm hoping it doesn't happen, uh, but as... Maybe they're fed up of being on the show. Maybe they want to leave. Maybe this is a good way to get them off the show for a while to have them in prison. And then when we want them back, we uh, prove that they were innocent and Duncan goes to jail. Uh, something like that happens. As you know, characters just disappear all the time. We've not seen Norris in weeks. Where is Norris? Did Norris actually leave? Let us know in the comments um, below. I do want to say, though, when we're talking about um, Peter and Carla, that we've got this whole all they won't they storyline. We've got all these affair storylines going on. I think something's going to happen between Abby and Steve. And it's all the stuff we've seen before. It's nice that Coronation Street are able to toy with us a little bit and give us different variations of an affair storyline. We've got a fake affair storyline. Um, it's not something that I have witnessed before on either Coronation Street or Emmerdale. So it's interesting to see uh, someone fantasising about an affair and trying to make uh, the affair seem like a reality. And um, obviously Tim's doubting whether Sally did have the affair or not. He wants to believe Sally, but he's struggling a bit, even though in real life you'd have to think, well, if there's no evidence, then I'll just side with you then. Unless there was evidence to suggest you did have an affair, but the only evidence is uh, these messages that we can't confirm did come from you or not but yeah it's nice to see that 
they are trying to think of new ways of uh, the whole affair storyline. And as I said, affair storylines can be a bit boring and a bit tedious because we have seen them all before. But it's nice that they're managing to just twist it up a bit and give us different variations of it. So now we're going to move on and talk about Sean. Sean is still homeless and Sean's life has just completely deteriorated this week. He's gone from having his job at the Rovers, which was ruined for him by his friend coming in, uh, Jenny, telling Sean to ask his friend to leave. His friend said, oh, I'll just get a bit of booze and I'll leave. So Sean tries to sneak the vodka in. He gets caught and he gets sacked. While he was doing that, we got a glimpse of the drinks that the Rovers return sells. And they sell my favourite beer, actually, which is Newcastle Brown Ale. So it makes me think if I was ever in the Rovers... That's what I'd be asking for. What would you ask for if you were at the Rovers? Let us know in the comments below. Uh, so, Sean's sacked. Sean doesn't have a job. He doesn't have a house. And now he's had to resort to begging. And we're sort of seeing the other characters uh, witnessing how Sean's life is deteriorating. We see Eileen offer Sean to use the house for a shower. And Sean almost tearing up at how grateful he is to be able to go into a house and have a shower and things. We have the whole dramatic irony with Fizz, was, oh, we all know Sean, he's always okay, he always lands on his feet. Well, he's not okay, and he's not landed on his feet. Um, and we have Sean, C, Rana and Billy on the way to the hospital while he's outside begging, and he tries to hide so they don't see him uh, begging. And it is tough on Sean. It's a good storyline. And they have picked a good character to do the storyline. And I like Sean with a serious storyline. Whilst watching the show, I've never really liked Sean's character until now. Until we actually see Sean in a serious, desperate situation. I've actually really... Well, enjoy isn't the right word. Because he he's suffering. Uh, but I've really felt the sympathy for him. I felt empathy for him. And it's nice to see Sean in a more serious storyline instead of where we normally see Sean just making rice cracks and all these jokes and things. We we see a more serious, mature side to Sean. And I've actually really enjoyed that aspect of the character. And And when the storyline is resolved, I'm hoping that we see more of this serious Sean than the lighter comic relief character. I always like it when a character gets proper development and they're given a serious storyline. I mean, I think I'm going to gloss over the whole Angie and Jude storyline because not much has really happened this week. We've seen them in marriage counselling. They've got a cotton wedding anniversary coming up. Mary wants them to renew their vows at a cotton mill because it's their cotton wedding anniversary, which I think is quite nice. That's the venue that Tracy wanted, though, so Mary's had to convince Tracy to let them have the venue. And it seems that Jude has a problem with Adam. And that's pretty much it this week. So I'm sure we'll see some sort of confrontation between Jude and Adam in the next couple of weeks, but let's wait until the next couple of weeks to talk about it. So we'll go on to Josh now, as I promised I would. Uh... Billy visits Josh and Josh is still blind. And that's all that's really happened this week with Josh. But uh, there has been a lot of complaints with the storyline. Um, because there's not enough evidence to convict him of rape, um, the writers have given this sort of eye for an eye, literally, type justice where he's blind now. Uh, and that's his punishment, is being blind which a lot of fans are happy about because it's like, well, at least he's got some sort of punishment. And a lot of people are unhappy about that because it's almost like because of the idea of the karma is he's lost his sight when plenty of people have lost their sight and done absolutely nothing wrong. A lot of people are born blind. A lot of people can be attacked for doing absolutely nothing wrong and result in being blinded. A lot of people can just go blind through illness so there is a few complaints with people that the idea of blindness being a punishment is offensive to the blind community, which I completely understand. 
Um, I'm glad that there is some sort of justice that he has got. But as we said, that could be seen as fairly offensive. I do like how Billy isn't sort of, oh, well, you deserve to be blind. We've not, we've not got that. We might have David saying, I'm glad you're blind. You deserve it, which would, could be offensive. And Billy's saying, you know, you can live a full life without sight. Thing about Josh is he can still listen to the Corydale reviews. Lewis is back. Uh, Audrey visited Lewis in prison and Lewis has given Gail 40 thousand pounds. Lewis is trying to convince Audrey that he's changed, he wants to be a good person, he turned himself in, he's going to get released on Wednesday. Will Audrey go back with Lewis and how is Gail going to spend the £40,000? I have a theory, um, obviously Maria needs an investor, maybe Gail will invest in the salon with Maria. Maybe not. We'll find out. Let us know what you think Gail's going to do with the £40,000 in the comments below. So the final storyline we'll talk about is the one with Rana. And I mentioned a lot in my previous review that it was a bit offensive that you have uh, the Muslim characters acting as bigots and... Uh, that Rana's having to apologise for her lifestyle and in Friday's episode she was having to say oh it is disgusting, it's it's the three S's, it's stupid, shameful and self-indulgent and against nature and again I think it's a little bit over the top I think this storyline would have worked really well about three or four years ago I think now bigotry does still exist but I think society doesn't turn as much of a blind eye to bigotry anymore as they used to. It's going to be difficult viewing when Rana's mother finds out that Rana lied about breaking up with Kate. It's nice that Kate did suggest it was okay and Rana did it and Kate's not offended at all. It's nice that because that could have been an added layer to the storyline. Um, but I, I'm 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 happy that uh, Kate was okay with it because she could understand Rana's desperation. I do love how Rana's dad gripped her hands before he died. Um, but again, the context troubles me because of the fact that it was uh, the forgiveness as he died. But forgiveness, he's forgiving her for being gay. But he's, he's not even forgiving her for being gay, he's forgiving her for being gay and then seeing the light, seeing the error of her ways, which I say with air quotations because there is nothing wrong with it. And this is why I think the storyline would have worked really well three or four years ago, whereas now, whereas now the context, the whole forgiveness aspect is a bit offensive. But we do know that bigotry is still prevalent in our society, although thankfully not as much as it was in the past. Rana's still got the funeral, so she's still going to have to, she's got two choices, she can either come clean to her mum, or she can try and hide the relationship until the funeral's over. And as we know, it's a soap and all secrets come out in the end, get caught by her mum and have this big confrontation you lied your your father you lied on your father's death mate deathbed Allah will never forgive you sort of thing so I think that's that's coming to the end of um everything that happened we had a bit with Leanne as well I won't forget Leanne uh Leanne's struggling with life because the fact that she hates toddler group and her life is dictated by the fact that she has a young son Steve's taking Oliver for the night so that Leanne can let her hair down and enjoy herself. And I think it was very nice because she wanted a job with Imran. And Imran, despite losing his father, offers Leanne a seat and speaks to her. And I'm thinking, I'm hoping, oh, please, please, please don't sleep with each other or some, that sort of thing. Please don't make it one of those uh, storylines. Um, they went back to Imran's house 
We don't know what's happened. We can only guess. So I go from thinking, oh, Imran, that's so nice. The fact that your father's died and you're allowing this woman to apply for a job with you has gone to, he's going to use her, he's going to sleep with her, that sort of thing, which I hope it's the former, not the latter. That influences my view of the character. So the best character this week, I think, one of my favourite characters in the show at the moment is Toya. I liked her uh, thing with Simran, where it was, uh, oh, you shouldn't be so rude, don't, typical man, thinks whatever he's doing is more important. I shall finish my conversation and you will wait. I I enjoy seeing the way that Toya thinks. Um, We had it a few weeks ago where uh, she's just fallen out with Peter and she saved the dog and she comes in and Peter's saying thank you and and Simon as well. And then they say, oh, she saved the dog's life. And then Toya just goes, who's she, the cat's mother? Uh, even though, you know, Toya, you're in the doghouse, you know, you can't, you can't really talk to someone like that while, when you're done something so horribly wrong, but, you know, she, that, that's more important to Toya than anything else. I really do like Toya's character. Uh, the worst character this week had to be the child who gave Sean, uh, the money, uh, the pound. Mumme, mumme, can we give this man a pound? There you go, mister. Um, you know, I don't want to seem like I'm being mean to child actors, but the problem is when you do have a child actor that is that poor, uh, it takes away from the impact of the storyline. And I don't want to be mean or anything, but it was very noticeably bad. And it was a shame because it took away from the drama and the potency of what's just happened and the impact and the emotion. The funniest moment of the week had to be um, when Sarah wants to work harder at the factory to impress Carla. And Gary's like, who's going to help me at the factory? Did you look at the job agency? And Sarah's like, no, no, I I found your replacement. There she is. And then there's Gail, (laughs) happy to help. Oh, fantastic. So all in all, it was a very good week of Coronation Street. I enjoyed it very much and I'm looking forward to the next week. I'm hoping that you're looking forward to it too. I'm hoping you enjoy the week as well. Let me know what you thought. Let me know your highlight of the week. Let me know your low light of the week. Let me know exactly what you thought. If I missed anything, I hope I didn't because I wrote everything down. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe. And I'll see you all next week on the Corydale Reviews.